Welcome to the Defense and Airspace Report. I'm Fagum Radian here in sunny Orlando, Florida, where we are at the Air Force Association's annual Air Warfare Symposium. This year's topic is command and control and fusion warfare. Our coverage here is sponsored in part by DRS Technologies, and we're honored to have with us my good friend, uh, retired Air Force Lieutenant General Dave Deptula, who is the Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Dave, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Vago. Um, I want to start off, uh, you know, you and I have been talking periodically, uh, we talk often, but I want to ask specifically, what are some of the messages, you know, very, very interesting time of transition, a uh, new administration, there's talk about bigger defense spending, the debate is how much more defense spending, but what are some of the messages we're going to hear from the Air Force leadership over the next two days? Well, Vago, I think you know that the Air Force leadership just finished one of their quarterly senior conferences known as Corona. So. It will be interesting to see how much the Air Force leadership shares with respect to their perspectives on the challenges that are facing the Air Force. In particular, is there gonna be a continuing resolution for the rest of the year? Um, what are they gonna do about the challenges that are posed with the readiness crisis, the modernization crisis, the crisis in terms of retaining sufficient pilots? You know, the Air Force is approaching a thousand fighter pilots shortage and you put Air Mobility Command on top of that, now you're upwards of 1,500 pilots short. Uh, our chief, uh, Dave Goldfein, just made the comment the other day that there is not an enemy on the face of the earth that could do more damage to the United States Air Force than by not giving it a budget from which to plan so that we can come up with solutions to meet these challenges that I've talked about. I think you're going to hear a lot about that. One other thing, perhaps we might hear from them their thoughts on the necessity to reorganize the Air Force because it can no longer produce the capabilities uh, and the capacity that the nations come upon to, re to, to rely on the Air Force to accomplish its missions. Well, let me take you uh, to that point. Let me ask you about what your priorities should be and, and tell me about that specific reorganization as well. What is the kind of organization that the Air Force needs well, to undertake? I, again, I, I, I don't want to go into specifics because quite frankly, that's, you know, the sausage is being made now um, and we'll see. Uh, but the fact of the matter is the Air Force major commands have been in existence for a long, long time. Uh, one could say the formation of our Air Force structure today is still an outcome or outgrowth of what happened in after World War II. Uh, well, I was at Air Force Times when uh, Merrill McPeak reorganized it into Air Combat Command, reorganized right. it into Mobility Command. Right. So that was that right. huge shift. That was a that was a first step, moving toward outcomes or functions as opposed to organizing by medium. But it didn't go all the way. So I think you'll see um, a functional bent as an option for one of the Air Force reorganizational options. But the details are still uh, quite early to talk about those. Let's talk about priorities. What do you think sure. the top priorities are for the United States Air Force, well, or, sh or should be in this hopefully positive growing budget environment? Well, positive growing budget environment, yes, but we're not there. I go back to, you know, first priority is get rid of sequestration, get an established budget. We can't survive. We can survive, but it's going to be very, very difficult. And the Air Force is not going to be able to meet the challenges that face it with a continuing resolution. Um, you know, the president just proposed a $54 billion increase DOD-wide uh, uh, and, and, and claims that that is a huge increase. It's not really, if you put it in the context that eight years ago, defense spending was 4.6% of the GDP. Today it's 3.2%. That's a collapse in defense spending. So $54 billion um, just gets us to treading water. Well, uh, but economists would say also that at that time, the economy was a lot worse than it is now, that the economy has been growing and we've had a couple of years of growth, and so that has increased the, the GDP size so overall the, as well. The fact of the matter is there's not sufficient money today in the budget to maintain the capabilities that the Air Force needs 
to execute the nation's security strategy. And that's similar to the other services as well. But of all of the services, the Air Force is the hardest hit. We have a geriatric force. We're operating bombers that are over 50 years old, tankers that are over 50 years old, um, training aircraft that are over 40, fighters and helicopters that are over 30, and it's not just the airplanes. You know, our nuclear intercontinental ballistic missile force is 40 years old. We have demands on our ISR forces that are insatiable. And when you look at space, we provide a global utility without getting reimbursed for it, GPS. And we've got threats that are evolving that are challenging our space architecture that's fundamental to the way we do business. And then you add on to this the increased demand for cyber. So all these new mission areas uh, on top of the traditional mission areas, I mean, the air is not going away. You know, it is the third dimension inside the atmosphere. Um, so how, how are we going to deal with this? What are some of the programmatic priorities you would have? Obviously, improving readiness is important. Addressing the, the manpower shortfall is very, very important. That's going to take many, many years to try to address. Um, basically, you have to plant those seeds now so you can harvest those at the earliest in six to 10 years, uh, especially for, for, for that experiential. I mean, this, right. is, this is a decades-long challenge that the service will have to face. But from a programmatics on, on that side, where, where are some of the things, obviously, you think that the Air Force should focus itself? You know, is it, for example, more light counterinsurgency aircraft, for example, as some suggest? Um, it, it is in recapitalizing our force. Okay, the number one priority, quite frankly, well, let me not, <laughs> let, let me not talk number one priorities because... You know, that, I'll defer that uh, to the chief to answer, but some of the Air Force's top priorities, number one are people. The chief has come out with his objective of raising the active duty force up to 350,000. We're about 317,000 strong today, so that's 33,000 more people. Here's a key element of that statement. That 350,000 is what we need to get to 100% of our manning requirements that exist today. Not, in the, not seven years in the future, but today. So that's huge across the board in all the mission areas. Um, I talked about how uh, old, ancient, geriatric our Air Forces are. Um, we need to get the F-35 rate up from 43 where it is today to 60, 80, 100 aircraft per year by 2020. That's not just smart to recapitalize this geriatric fighter force that we have, it's also smart economically because you save money in the long run. Of course, the tanker's coming on board. We have the B-21 that's a, you know, in its gestation phase, if you will. Uh, and, and then space. Space is another place that we've got to put a lot of emphasis in the context of being able to protect the assets that we have. You have been uh, a big uh, thinker, but also one of the most passionate advocates for all fifth generation force. Uh, F-22 obviously was, was something that was very important, but obviously the F-35 is another important component of that. Um, when he was president-elect, but also some comments since he was president, uh, Donald Trump has, has criticized the F-35 program. Uh, some argue that that was part of a negotiating uh, process to try to reduce the cost of the program, although analysts will say that the program ended up roughly at the same cost given the work that the program office and everybody has been investing in that. But one of the specific things that he said, and he said it repeatedly, is a comparable F-18 or that somehow the F-18 could supplant or, or somehow replace the F-35. You're, again, very passionate on this issue. But why are those two aircraft? And, but there are some on the team who have suggested, well, that the Air Force can get fewer fifth generation airplanes and should be buying much more fourth generation airplanes. Without putting a specific airplane there against that mix, why is that a bad idea from your standpoint? Um, well, because the decision calculus that ultimately is behind people's logic in that regard is only focused on cost per individual unit. It doesn't take into consideration capability. And so what the president, the Department of Defense, the Congress have to move toward in terms of measures of effectiveness or cost per desired effect or desired outcome as a measure of merit. Now it's harder to do, but let me give you an example. 
If the F-35 is six to 10 times more effective in accomplishing mission results than an F-A-18, and it's coming down to a comparable cost, which one really provides more value? I mean, if it takes 10 of airplane X to accomplish the equivalent of airplane Y, airplane Y is cheap at 10 times the cost. So we have to move off of this notion of, well, this airplane is less expensive than that airplane without considering the effectiveness of what it can do. Well, let me take you to that. Obviously, there's a groundswell of support. Uh, there are some in the Trump team who've talked to me about the importance of the Air Force buying uh, several hundred, perhaps, uh, counterinsurgency aircraft. Um, why, you know, th there are folks who say, look, some of these protracted operations or counterinsurgency operations will be part of, uh, for example, operations in Afghanistan for a long time, will be engaged in Iraq. You don't need an F-35 in order necessarily to do that. Let's try to do that with a less expensive asset. You're not crazy about that idea. Why not? And what are the potential pitfalls of going down that road from your standpoint? Well, first, um, I, I think it is an idea worthy of exploration uh, because the fact of the matter is, so uh, I don't disagree with that approach, but we have to have a balanced force structure. And that's what people also tend to forget. They focus so much on the activities and the events and the circumstances that we're involved in today um, and then quite frankly, over the last 15 years, we've been operating in permissive airspace with no resistance. And so you're right. Uh, I mean, the last two years that we had F-16s at Balad Airfield in Iraq, two squadrons worth, they were tasked 100% of the time to do intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance road recce with sniper pods. Well, you don't need an F-16 capable platform to do that. You can do that with an MQ-1 or an MQ-9. Uh, and likewise with um, low threat counterinsurgency operations. So I think it's valuable to take a look at some of these alternatives so that we're not using up, putting, uh, putting age on aircraft that are much, much more capable and they don't need to use all their capabilities in the kind of counterinsurgency operations that we're in. But then there needs to be a judgment made in the context of investment relative to high order threats that we will fight against. We haven't seen the end of major regional conflict. As long as there are human beings around, we will be involved in one of those activities. And we need to be prepared. If we're gonna maintain our position as the world's sole superpower, we need to be able to fight and win and succeed across a spectrum of conflict. For the last 26 years, we've been fighting in permissive airspace in the lowest end of the conflict. And we've got adversaries out there that have been watching us and learning that they cannot allow the United States to achieve air dominance. And so they've been fighting very hard to counter that. You, uh, you know, entered the Air Force in 1974 after being a distinguished graduate from the uh, University of Virginia, uh, Thomas Jefferson's fabled school uh, in, in Virginia. Your mindset as you were going through school was at, you know, you, the Vietnam experience was very true. You had classmates who were going off to Vietnam. You had instructors. Everybody was fresh from that conflict. And that was not, you know, that was really the war from hell in a lot of ways because it did combine the highest end uh, electronic warfare, surface to air weaponry. Um, what's the kind of mindset change um, that's necessary in the force from your standpoint to get people tuned to that high intensity kind of combat that may await us in the event of any major power confrontation? It's an excellent question, it's a complex one. It also reinforces the importance of history um, because over 85% of all the military folks who are on active duty today came on board after 9-11. That's all they know. Their experience is grounded in counterinsurgency, small-scale contingencies. Um, it, it's important to be proficient in those kinds of conflicts. At the same time, those are not existential conflicts that, were challenge, that will challenge us to the extent that, for example, in Vietnam, we lost over 50% of our F-105 force. It, that's incredible. And you know, we lose two or three airplanes today, and it is a big deal. But we lost hundreds and hundreds of aircraft. 
So we have to be careful about. And, and that was just of one type, right? No, absolutely. Right? You were talking oh, yeah, about. No, no, no. We lost over 7,000 airplanes, 7,000 airplanes in Vietnam. Including B 52s with multi man crew. I mean, it, it was a. 15 B 52s. Right. Okay, we have a total of 20 B 2s in the force today. And at any one time, you, you're going to get less than two handfuls in the air on any kind of a mission. That's why we need to recapitalize this geriatric force. So a lot of it is history and understanding and watching and becoming aware of what the threat's doing. They learned our lessons. They don't want to see what happened to Iraq in Operation Desert Storm occur or what happened to Milosevic in Kosovo occur. So the way they do that is by keeping us out of the airspace. But look, if you recall, Secretary Gates terminated the F-22 by at less than half of the military requirement for that aircraft. And today we're wishing we had more. Not just for a potential dust up with the PRC somewhere, South China Sea or you pick it, but in locations that we can't anticipate today, but will be populated by advanced double digit SAMs that will have cyber capabilities that you know, we've never faced before. So we need to think about and put emphasis on how do we deal with high-end threats? And we need to be able to deal with those kind of threats where we win 99 to one, not 51 to 49, which is the kind of force that Secretary Gates was satisfied with buying. Let me take you to the ISIS fight. You've been passionate and spoken quite a lot about this. Uh, President Trump has asked for options, um, you know, on how to more effectively uh, execute this campaign. Supporters of it, uh, including some folks who have been critical of the last administration, have said actually it's a very successful campaign in a targeted and very methodical way. It puts the Iraqis up front. But what are some of the changes that you'd like to see as an air power advocate in how this conflict is prosecuted? That is very delicate. Everybody is trying not to incur or inflict any more casualties than are absolutely necessary to achieve the objective. What are some of the, what, what, what would you like to see? Well, first of all, let me correct you. Not everybody is interested in reducing civilian casualties. The Islamic State is intentionally trying to create as many civilian casualties as possible. The quickest way to decompose the Islamic State is to treat air power as the key force as opposed to just merely a supporting element of indigenous ground forces. Doesn't mean that that's not an important piece, but it's taken time. Okay, it's been two and a half years now for the U.S. to assist the Iraqis to get to the point where their surface forces can now push out the ISIS uh, assaults on their territory and occupation. What I would tell you is the United States needs to get more serious about real politique and think about what are the critical U.S. national security interests. And while maintaining and assisting Iraq uh, regain its sovereignty is a nice to do, it's not as critical a U.S. national security interest as is preventing the Islamic State from retraining a sanctuary from which they can export terror to the United States and the rest of the world. So the way you deal with that is you go to the directly to the locus of the Islamic State as an organization, and you eliminate their leadership, their key systems, their financial system, their banking system, their police system, their infrastructure. Uh, and we can do that if you think about using air power as a key force. We can do it very, very rapidly. And it can be done in a way in accordance with the laws of armed conflict. But it's a re it would be a reverse of the approach that's being taken today, which is Iraq first. If you look at the anemic application of air power over the last two and a half plus years in Syria, we've only averaged seven strike sorties a day against the Islamic Strait in Syria. That, that's not sufficient amount of force to do that. Thinking in the context of how do we decompose the Islamic State's ability to operate, um, we could have, now, you know, in, in talking about we could have, well, that's passed, but we can still dramatically ramp up, shift the gears from one of support to one of key force, eliminate the Islamic State. But 
We've got people who are generating options who are people who have been involved in counterinsurgencies for the last 15 years. And this is a concern. Well, so I want to take you to that question. Um, obviously, General Mattis gets very, very strong uh, marks as the defense secretary, clearly a strategist uh, of, of the first order, a real military intellectual thinker, um, obviously somebody who has a lot of combat experience, also has air experience, even though he's a Marine officer, he was a MAGTAF officer in his, in his career as well. But there are in air power circles some concerns about the team, and I want to ask you about that. If you look at it, you know, General Mattis is a, is a Marine, uh, very strong ground uh, experience there. Uh, Keith Kellogg is an Army officer. John Kelly is a, is a Marine. H.R. McMaster uh, is uh, a very uh, passionate, very intelligent guy, PhD, uh, great sense of humor, but is a passionate ground warfare uh, proponent in, in, his, in his career and a ground warfare thinker. You know, there are airmen who point out that there are no airmen in this senior team. How much of a concern is that? Why is it a concern? And what can be done to address it at this point? Well, first off, let me preface my remarks um, uh, by saying that uh, Joe Mattis, um, who I spoke with yesterday, by the way, um, General Dunford, General Kelly, um, General McMaster, General Kellogg, um, they're all outstanding individuals uh, and have turned in magnificent performances uh, over their careers um, as uh, officers in the United States military. But their expertise is all in surface warfare. And so there's a bit of a concern that their advice to the president um, will be shaped by uh, a bit of groupthink because it's human nature to offer perspectives based on one's experience. And you see all of these gentlemen um, are surface warfare officers. So it's important for the president to get a spectrum of alternatives. Uh, you know, and, and if, if you want proof, just take a look at the recommendations coming out of the Pentagon this week. Back to the president, he asked for how do we increase our, our effort uh, to terminate the ability of the Islamic State to operate as rapidly as possible. What are the alternatives that are coming out? More boots on the ground. There's no surprise there, given the leadership that are providing that advice. So, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the president needs a variety of advisors with a variety of different experiences. Not that one's any better than the other, but he needs to have the understanding uh, and the insight that someone who's just experienced in air warfare as H.R. McMaster or uh, General Mattis is in land warfare can have the opportunity to get alternatives on the table. Are you uh, available to do some consulting or advising uh, on the side? I'll just, I'll, I'll leave that alone. I mean, I, the, the issue is not uh, personal. The issue is one of perspective. Uh, and we want the president to have a variety of options uh, when he's faced with a really tough uh, security decision. Dave, thanks very much for spending so much time with us. We appreciate it. Thank you.